as I said earlier, Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, is where we're coming from this morning. You know, one of the things that I'm finding increasingly frustrating as I get older, I just celebrated my 51st birthday, and some of you guys, I understand that's not much, but uh, just bear with me, okay? I've never been here before. But one of the things that I'm finding is, uh, is the, in, the increasing difficulty I have in being able to, to focus. Now, I've never been a really good one at doing that anyway. Uh, when I was in high school, and let's tell you how times have changed, I shot competition marksmanship in high school. Not with BB guns, with actual 22s. They wouldn't imagine letting you on campus with a weapon nowadays. But I used to, when I got out on the range, I would, I would put in earplugs, plus I would wear earmuffs, so that I, I wasn't distracted by anything else going on in the range. I just wanted to be able to, you know, focus down range, and, and that was it. When I would do my homework, I couldn't have the radio on. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't do my homework when I did it in front of the TV because, you know, I'd see something or I'd hear something and I'd get lost. Matter of fact, even to this day, if my daughter or my wife come through the house and they hear music coming out of the den when I'm working, they come and check and see what's going on because I just, I just can't do that. My wife will have the radio going, the TV on and, and doing something else and she's involved in all of it. Me? Uh-uh. I, I, I need to be, I, I just can't do that. Matter of fact, I even have trouble, if I read more than one book, I have to make them like I do a theology and a fiction. Or pretty soon I have God fighting out with aliens, you know. I, I just really got to kind of keep them separated. I, I just, I, you know, I just guess I just can't, I can't multitask like some of you guys can. I, I really need to focus. But I don't think I'm alone in that. Because, um, you know, it's really easy to lose things in the, the din of, of life, in the noise of life. It's really easy to forget stuff. It's really easy to overlook stuff. When life gets so busy, you know, and you're, you're handling the tyranny of the urgent, you know, that which is right there, right in your face, you know, it's really easy to distract you from, from other things. And one of the things that, that easily gets lost is, is God. God gets lost in the background of life. You know, we get busy with things that are going on or maybe preoccupied with good, bad, or otherwise. And, and pretty soon we begin to ask ourselves, well, where's God? You know, I, I, as Linda said, I, I haven't heard him lately. He's still speaking. He's just kind of, you know, been lost in, in everything else that's going on. But that's not a situation unique to us today here in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, we see a time in the, in the history of humanity when things you think are bad now, they were bad even more so then, and God had been lost completely. But the, the biblical record gives us this bright and shining spot of a man by the name of Noah, who even though the world had, had truly grown deaf to the voice of God, Noah hadn't. And I see that and I, I think what an encouraging message that is to know that even in the best, or excuse me, in the worst of times, God's voice doesn't have to be lost. He doesn't have to be drowned out. So I'm hoping there's some things from the life of Noah that we might be able to apply uh, to our living today. So I'm going to begin in verse 6 and read through verse 13. It says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, and from man to animal to creeping things to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Now, it doesn't take much reading to realize that those are kind of the introductory verses to the account of, 
of Noah. And let me take a let me take a couple minutes to talk about the whole account of Noah. Some folks look at at, at Noah's situation and they refer to it as a, a fable. And they say when you look across the spectrum of human history and you look at different cultures, you always find this what is called a deluge event. Some record about a flood. And indeed, if you look at the, the, the Assyrians and you, you even look in the southwestern uh, Indian history, you look at the Alaskans. As a matter of fact, if you look, and somebody did this, uh, through cultures at large, he found 88 different cultures that record some sort of flood account in their history. And some people want to look at the account of Noah and they want to say that it's just a myth, it's just a fable. It's just a story. You know, when I was a kid, we used to watch this cartoon it was called Aesop's Fables, and it would tell a story, and then it would have a, you know, a little moral at the end. And some people would look at that, and they would say, this is nothing more than the Bible's account of, you know, some local flood or some local catastrophe that got blown out of proportion and used to teach a lesson. Well, let me tell you something. That's just not true. It's not true for a couple of reasons. One is this. The, the cuneiform text of the ancient Near East, the, the writing and the records that we have from them, in no way, no shape, no form, in no manner compare to the inspired Word of God. Okay? I don't often ask for an amen, but I would have kind of expected one on that. If this indeed is the Word of God for all matters of my life and my faith and the things that I do, then I probably... I hope you look at the Word of God differently than you do the writings of others. The Bible is a distinct work. It is not, though penned by, by men, it does not have man as its author. It is, it is from the heart of God through the hand of man to you. And it conveys to us the working and the actions of God. The writings in 87 of those other cultures cannot be placed on the same par as Scripture. So when I, when I approach the account of the flood and I look at some of the others, one of the things that I have to recognize right from the beginning is the fact that, that the Bible is a distinctly different book. It is not a book that in any way, shape, or form contains error. Now, there are parts of it that I may not fully understand. There are parts of it that may appear to be a contradiction to me. But I'll tell you what, every time somebody has pointed to the Bible and said, aha, here we have a fallacy, that person has been proved wrong, never the Word of God. So I approach the, the Bible with a, a little different perspective than I do the history books of others. That's one reason why I've got to say that the account of Noah cannot be compared to uh, the accounts of others. Another reason is this, after the flood and after the, the, the rain stopped and the waters receded, how many people were there on the earth? Eight. Noah, his wife, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and their daughters. And every person that has ever existed from that time forward descends through, uh, through, uh, through Noah, his wife, one of his three sons. Correct? Assume with me for a moment that you believe the biblical testimony. Okay? Everybody would descend through these three boys, correct? So these three boys would have shared with their children, who will have shared with their children, who have shared with their children this account of God's flood on the earth, right? Does that not explain how it's found its way into the cultures of others? They're carrying the account on. But their account, let's pick on the Alaskans, their account is their cultural account. And it's not a biblical account. It's not a record account. It has been shaped. It has been altered. God has preserved this record for us. So, all right, maybe we can answer the question about the literary evidence. What about the physical evidence? Come on, pastor, you know, there's a lot of scientists out there that say there's no evidence for a flood. Well, let me tell you something. There's a lot of evidence out there for a flood, okay? I don't know if you're aware in this day and age, science has kind of been co-opted and hijacked to where they, they piddle on things that they don't agree with and elevate things that they do. One, one example, global warming. Global, now they call it climate change. Because they found out that global warming isn't really as accurate as they thought, so they're 
talking about climactic change. Okay? Science is not inspired either. And if humanity wants to look at the, at the, objectively look at the evidence present in creation, there is plenty of evidence. From a mile, mile wide, or mile deep um, a layer of soot that covers the earth to, to, to see uh, fossils found at the tops of mountains, there is plenty of evidence to argue for a worldwide deluge event. But you're not going to get a scientist who is not a believer to agree with that. Because you know why? If they agree that the Bible is right, then science just might be wrong. So they're not going to do that. I would recommend to you a, an excellent book called The Genesis Flood. Yeah, it's in your notes. It's written by a, a man by the name of Dennis Lindsay. And he's a believer, but he also, uh, he also takes a look at it based on the evidence. And there is ample evidence to suggest that indeed a worldwide event. So when we look at this situation here, I say all of that to tell you that this isn't just some little fable, some myth, some legend that, you know, the ancient writers put in the Bible in order to explain some local flood. This account is in there, first of all, because it happened. And secondly, because it tells us something about God and it tells us about walking in a relationship with him. The first thing that it tells us is that the world was pretty bad. I mean, the Bible, the Bible makes it clear that Noah lived in some rough times. It says that the conditions were so deplorable that Yahweh said, I'm sorry I ever made man. Now think with me for a minute. And I would hate to imagine that you have ever said this or that it has ever been said to you, but can you imagine how bad things would be if somebody looked you in the eye and said, you know, I'm sorry I ever had you. You know, how would you feel if, if your dad looked at you and said, I rue the day that you were born. Boy, it, things would have to be pretty bad for that. But that's what God's doing. He looks down and the, and the, and the account tells us that man was wicked. He didn't just do things that were wrong. He didn't just you know, do things that were, were in disagreement with God. He was wicked. So bad, it says in, in verse 5, that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continuously. You kind of see those superlatives building on one another? It's every intent, every thought was always continually evil. He'd get up in the morning, he'd say, how can I do bad? He'd go throughout the day and say, how can I do bad? He'd go to bed at the end of the night and say, when I get up in the morning, I'm going to do bad. And if I can't wait till then, I'll do it tonight. Always, continually. Now, now, let me explain something. I understand that we live in bad times. I understand that man is sinful. I understand that wickedness does abound, but it is not that bad. Right? It's pretty bad. But... It's not that bad. We had, we had a, a lady in the RV park fell and, and, and broke her leg. And the people that arrived, some of them are not believers. Not one of them said, you know what, let's lay, let her lay here and suffer. Not one of them said, you know what, why don't we just throw her in the canal out back. She's going to die anyway. Not one of them said, you know what, I'll go home and get a gun and we'll just put her down. Not one of them said that, even though there were non-believers present in the time of, <coughs> excuse me, in the time of noses, noses, how do you like that one? In the time of Noah, they'd have done that. Let her die. Why take your time? Why even go there? They wouldn't have had a fire department. Somebody's house is on fire. Good luck. Wasn't me. I'll bring the weenies. We'll cook it over, over the fire. Things were bad. <laughs> Excuse me, this is not a hyperbole. See, I, I don't think we fully appreciate how wicked humanity can be. I mean, I really don't. I dare you, I push you, I challenge you to go and read of the accounts in Nazi Germany. There was a home in Upper Bavaria that was, that was founded for, for children with Down syndrome and physical handicaps. And when Hitler came to power in, in 1935 and, and later into the years right before the war, the first thing he wanted to do 
will shut down places like that and kill those people. It's the first thing you want to do. He ultimately did. Why? Because he was evil. They took doctors and they would open up captured prisoners of war and they would sew their innards together and put them in freezing water to see how long they could survive. They would roll into Polish towns and they would rape and abuse the women and then set a building on fire with them in there alive. That's evil. I don't think we appreciate the depth and the wickedness of humanity. We like to say, well, you know, we make bad choices. Yeah, we make bad choices. But man can be pretty bad. Man can be pretty wicked. And so bad did it become that God looked down and said, you know what? Enough is enough. The Bible tells us that there's going to come another day like that. When God's going to witness upon humanity that enough is enough. And he's going to act and he's going to move against the sinfulness of man. Then it won't be with a, a flood, but this time it was. In judgment, God moved. The flood wasn't a natural event. The flood was a supernatural event. It wasn't just the result of too much rain. It was the fact that God sent the rain and opened up the, the Bible tells us, the fountains of the deep and judged man through this great deluge. This is not an account of a natural event. It is an account of Yahweh God moving on the sinfulness of man. We can't, we can't ignore that reality. God will judge as he has judged because he is a righteous God. But you know what? When I look at Noah, I'm encouraged to know that even in such a vile, evil, and wicked time that somebody could still hear the voice of God. I would recommend another book to you. It's called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Preacher, Spy, I believe. And it's about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor in Nazi Germany through the rise in the years of the Nazi regime. That in the midst of all of that wickedness, there were men that stood up and said, this is not right. And something that you don't hear from history is this. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was involved in the 20 July bomb plot to kill Hitler. Okay, You can wrestle with the ramifications of a preacher being involved in an assassination attempt. But I want you to know this. The vast majority of all the people involved in the plots to overthrow Hitler were believers. General Treskow, Klaus von Stauffenberg were all Christians who in the midst of such evil could say, you know what? This is not right. How do I know it's not right? Because God has said it's not right and we need to do something. It's encouraging when you look through the history of humanity that no matter how bad circumstances can become through that noise and that chaos and that wickedness and that sin God still speaks and God can be heard Noah was the sort of guy that that what was going on around him didn't distract him from what he knew to be important and when we look at the life of Noah we can be encouraged to know this that not only is it possible to hear God but that the physical circumstances going on around us do not affect or limit God's ability to speak even though everybody did what was on their heart it was always evil it was always continually that uh, you know turned toward doing what was wrong that didn't stop God and sometimes I think we forget about that we look at the world and we say oh the world's going to hell and it is it is but you know what? That doesn't mean God says there's nothing I can do. In the midst of all of the evil, God's not bound and God's not limited. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me. Because I get tired sometimes and I, when I watch the news or I, I read the paper or I see what's going on and you, you think, where are the righteous people, you know? Where, where are the godly people? 
oh Lord, it seems like at every turn, you know, you're put down. Matter of fact, Lena and I saw a movie this weekend and not one scene through the whole movie was there even mentioned God. What, not one glimpse was there of somebody who, who had the ear of God, who listened for God. And it was a depressing movie. And you want to look at the world and you want to go, is this the way it is? But when you look at Noah, you go, no matter how bad it is, God's still there. No matter how bad it is, doesn't mean that I've got to go with it. I can still walk in the midst of darkness, or as David said in the 23rd Psalm, through the valley of the shadow of death, and you're still with me. Isn't that great news? I think that's good news. So when I run into Noah, the temptation is to say, oh, geez, mankind's really bad. But then I'm reminded, well, yeah, mankind can get pretty bad, but you know what? God's still pretty good. And I can walk in relationship with him. How is that possible? How is it possible to walk in a relationship with God when the world is going to hell around you? I mean, they, they like to say that if you can keep your mind when everyone else around you is losing theirs, there's something wrong with you. Okay? Well, if, 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 if having God is something wrong, then I'll take that. Because when the world is going to hell around us, it's possible to still be godly. But how do we do that? In the life of Noah, we find some evidence. Take a look at verse 8. What does verse 8 say? The first part of verse 8. What does verse 8 say? Noah found, favor. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's how the song goes. That's the answer. If you had it on your sheet, you'd say, Noah found blank in the eyes of the Lord. You'd write in favor. Right? <laughs> Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. What does that mean? Let me put it to you in my translation. God saw Noah and it made him smile. Noah, Noah lived his life in the midst of a dark time and God saw him and God thumped his chest and said, that's my boy. That's my boy. Kind of like with, 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 uh, with Job. You know, and the devil shows up before God and says, you know, God, what about you know, this and that and, and all of that? And God says, hey, check out Job. Job's my son. Job loves me. Job warms my heart. Do you think about God that way? Do you think about the possibility of bringing a smile to Papa's face? To saying, you know what? I'm not concerned about rules. I'm not tied up in whether or not, you know, I, I do all the A's and the B's of, of the religious thing. When I get up in the morning, what I'm really concerned about is I want to make God smile. I want to be able to Look at me and say, that's my boy. You ever think about God that way? The, the possibility that you and I can have an emotional effect upon God. Do you even think of God as having emotions? Or is God to you like Mr. Spock? Well, that's illogical, Captain. You think God's that way? God doesn't get happy. God doesn't get sad. Though we do say God gets mad, that's an emotion. The idea that you can influence God's emotion, you can make him happy or you can make him sad, is testified throughout the Bible. God repeatedly looks down and said, man, they're just a hoot. You think God uses the word hoot? I do. I think God uses the word hoot. Noah made God smile. How is it possible to live in an evil world? Well, just live to make God smile. You know why evil happens? Is because people don't live to make God smile. Evil happens because they live to make them smile. I want what you want. Or I'm sorry, I want what you have. Therefore, I'm going to move in order to, to get it. And I don't care what i got to do. Kill, steal, lie. I'm going to do that. That's what causes evil to prevail. 
I want to live to make me smile. Noah was one who lived to say, I want to make God smile. And God indeed did. He looked at Noah and he said, that's like, my, that's like my kid. That's my boy. He wasn't like anyone else in all of the earth. In a time when everyone was doing what they wanted, Noah was doing what, what, what made God smile. He did that. Take a look at, at verse 9. He did that by walking with God. Noah walked with God. The idea of walking is just what you think. God's going this way and I'm going that way. When you get into the New Testament, the idea of discipleship is built off of that concept of two people walking together. Noah was a disciple of God. He walked with God. Where God went, he went. What God did, he did. He walked with God. God set the course, the path, the direction of his life. And as a result of that, God looked at Noah and God smiled when he saw Noah. As a result of walking with God, Noah didn't walk with his friends. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I find it funny that people will walk in relationship with God until friends or family show up. Well, why weren't you at Bible study or at church or, or something? And they'll say, we had family in town. Well, what were you doing? Well, they didn't want to come to church, so you know we didn't want them to feel bad. Make them feel bad! <laughs> say, hey, look, we'll be back in a bit. You know, enjoy yourself, whatever. But you know what? We're walking with the Lord today. Where God goes is where we're going. Well, you know, I don't want my friends to think that I'm a, you know, I'm one of them. What's one of them? No, you want them to think that you're one of them. Walk with God. You cannot bring a smile to God's face by walking after your own desires. You cannot bring a smile to God's face by walking after your friend's desires. The only way that you can bring a smile to God's face is by walking with God. And when you walk with God, and I'm not telling you to wear makeup or not wear makeup, wear a dress. If you're a guy, don't wear a dress. <laughs> oh, not wear a dress. I'm not telling you to go to this church and not go to that church. I'm not telling you to every day be here at this or every day be there. I'm not telling you rules. I'm saying that you get up in the morning and your agenda is where God goes, I'm going. I'm doing what God wants to do. You do that, you're going to make God happy. He's going to look at you and say, woohoo! That's my child. And it's not going to be because you're at church every day. And it's not because you memorized 500 Bible verses. And it's not because you gave so much money to the church. It's going to be because you said, Lord, in whatever I do, I want to do what you want me to do. Yeah. Now, parents, think about this. Just for a moment. Other than thinking your child was doing drugs... If your kid did everything you asked him to do, how would you feel? Like, wow, life's good. Why would God feel any different? Oh, that's my boy. He walks with me. But what does it mean? What does it mean that he walks with me? Take a look again at verse 9, what, what it says there. It said, Noah was righteous and Noah was blameless. So you kind of see what, what, what the Bible says. The Bible says this big statement that Noah made God smile. And you go, well, how did Noah make God smile? He walked with him. Well, what does it mean that he walked with him? It means that he was righteous and blameless. Okay? Each one kind of qualifies. Why do you think that's there? Because God wants you to know that in difficult times you can make him smile you can, you, can, you can walk with him. You can, you can do that by being righteous and blameless. You can hear God and respond to God in the most difficult of times. That's why it breaks it down. Well, what does it mean to be righteous and blameless? Notice first what it does not say. It does not say he was righteous and sinless. Is it possible to be sinless? No. 
No. I'm glad I didn't get a woo on that one. I can go out and sin. You inevitably will sin. Why? Because you and I don't understand how wicked we really are. Okay? That despite my best, I am so prone to sin, I'll find a way to sin. It may be minor, it may be major, but I'm going to drop the ball. So, I'm not called to be sinless. I'm called to be blameless. Hold that thought in the air for a minute. Let's go to the easy one. Righteous. You know what righteous is? It's to do the right thing. Noah did the right thing. How did Noah know what the right thing was? He was walking with God. It wasn't his opinion. It wasn't what I thought. It was what God said. God revealed to him, and then Moses, walking with God, did it. He did the right thing. Do you do the right thing? Not right by your standards, not right by my standards, not right by the standards of society, but right in the eyes of God. That You can say at the end of the day, regardless of anything else, God is okay with my actions. That's what Paul means when he talks in the New Testament in the book of Romans about following your conscience. Doing what you know with all certainty is okay with God. Now we have the benefit of a more sure word of testimony than Noah had. We have the word of God. So if you can say, I'm all right between me and God with doing a, you know, an eight ball of heroin and fooling around with my wife, you got a problem. Because the Word of God says that's not, that's not right. But if you come down to the end of the day and you say, you know what, Lord, I've sought to know your heart. And to the best of my ability today, I have, done, I have sought to do that which you would have me to do. That's all God's looking for. That's it. Do the right thing. And in those cases where I don't, that's where blameless comes in. In the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, Paul talks about this struggle that he experienced. He says, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing. I, I want to do good, but the good to do is not present in me. So I find this principle at work the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, that I do. What a wretched man that I am. Paul's talking about that tension that exists in the life of every believer where my heart's desire is to do the right thing. But my sinful humanity trips me up. And I try with all of my might to do the right thing. And I inevitably, at times, sin. So he says, it's no longer I who does it but the sin that dwells in me. It's not my fault. I'm blameless. My desire, my heart's cry is to walk in relationship with God, but sin keeps tripping me up. Well, what do I do about that sin? First John tells us that if I have sin, what do I do? I confess it. I repent of it. And I find forgiveness and cleansing. But my heart's desire, all that is within me, is to walk in relationship with God, to do the right thing. But sin trips me up. Despite everything I do, sin trips me up. So I sin not because I want to. I sin because I'm flawed. So I'm not to blame. That's blameless. I do not go out. And I had somebody tell me this last week. They said, well, I'm just human. I'm just human. And I said, no, you're not. The Spirit of God lives in you. And if you realize that you're just human, guess what? You're using it as an excuse. At the end of the day, I'm just human and I'm going to sin. But you know what? If I get up in the morning and say, I'm just human, I'm going to go through life. Whatever happens, happens. Making God smile is walking in relationship with Him. And walking in relationship with Him is looking to do the right thing as He reveals it. With all of our might and all of our effort so that that sin that we end up doing we really can't be blamed for. I did everything that I could 
you went to the doctor, your, your spouse was ill, they were injured in a car accident, and, and they rolled that, that, that spouse into the ER, and the doctor stood in the corner eating a liverwurst sandwich and smoking a cigarette, and your spouse died, the first thing you do after you beat him to a pulp would be get a lawyer. Right? And you'd say neglect. But if that doctor worked on your spouse and did everything that that was humanly possible to do, you would not blame that doctor, right? Can we tell God, you know, Lord, I did everything I possibly could and I sinned anyway. And God says, I understand you're not to blame. That's the sort of man Moses was. So let me tell you, let me, let me help you understand here. It's, it's possible in the midst of a sinful and a chaotic world it's, it's possible to hear God speak because he still speaks. It's possible to hear him. It's possible to live with him. It's possible to walk with him. It's possible to be right. It's possible to be blameless but it's not easy. It takes effort. It takes discipline. It takes determination. But it is possible. So let me invite you to bow your heads. To wait with me before God. As you consider this question. Are you listening for God? Well I try but you know. I, it's just really hard. I understand. But are you, are you listening for God? Well, you know, there's so many other things that, that, that cry for my attention. I understand. But are you listening for God? Well, you know, I've, I've tried, but I just don't know that He speaks. I'm telling you, He speaks. Are you listening for God? What do you got to do? What do you have to do in your life today to bring a smile to Papa's face? To walk with him? What do you need to do today that would be right in his eyes and cause him to look on you to be blameless? The answer is do it. For Father, we come before you. And Lord, we confess to you that we live in a, in a sinful time, though nothing of the quality that Noah experienced. We recognize that we live in a sinful time. And we readily admit that it's hard to hear you. But also, Father, we admit that we don't, we don't make it any easier. Help us to be a people that if we claim your name, that with all that is in us, we would seek to bring a smile to your face by walking in your relationship as we do what is right and seek to be blameless. And Lord, we ask this because of Jesus who makes it all possible. Amen.